Let's talk about friends. Not necessarily those kind of friends that you get on social media, where we all know people that can proudly say, hey, I've got 500 friends, and you ask them to name them, and they can name like three of them. But real friends, real friends in your life. Because now people with more friends have higher pain thresholds. Well, that's the finding of a new study carried out by researchers at Oxford University. It's all linked to endorphins in the brain, which are our body's natural painkillers, and how we get that feel-good factor when we see our friends. Katerina Johnson is a doctoral student at the university's Department of Experimental Psychology. I asked her what she was hoping to learn from this research. The basic question was, you know, trying to understand the possible sort of neurobiological basis for differences in social network size because we know that, you know, individuals vary a lot in, you know, the number of um, friends and family that they have in their social networks. Um, And in particular, um, we were interested in whether this variation in network size was related to the activity of a brain chemical called endorphin. So how did you actually carry out the experiments? Yes, yeah, so um, we um, had um, just over 100 participants and we were interested in their actual social networks um, and in particular the sort of two core inner layers. So we asked people um, to list um, members of their network and we looked at this in relation to both the frequency of contact and their emotional closeness. On average, um, you contact sort of your closest friends and family approximately sort of once a week and sort of the next layer out is anyone who you um, sort of contact on at least a monthly basis. And then in terms of um, looking at the endorphin system, um, this is pretty uh, tricky uh, to study directly because um, endorphins stay in the brain. Um, So if we want to measure them, we would have to extract spinal fluid. Um, which isn't very pleasant. Um, so um, we took advantage of the fact that you know they're they're very potent painkillers that are naturally produced by our body, and used a test of pain tolerance, um, where we asked individuals to basically squat against the wall, and it's known as the wall sit test. You might have remembered it. Mm-hmm. Some people when they do it in the gym, but it's pretty painful. And we looked at how long they could hold this position for. And and what was your theory? Those that had more friends on social networks would be able to cope with the pain for longer? Yes, so um, our theory comes down to the fact that as well as being implicated in the pain system, endorphins are also important for our feeling of um, connectedness to others um, and underpin social bonding. So we thought that individuals that had um, higher endorphin activity and so um, greater pain tolerance may also tend to be those individuals that maintain a greater um, number of social relationships. So would this transfer to having a real number of friends in the real world, or do you think this only works with social media friends? Yes, so we did actually study um, uh, real friends um, and rather than social media friends. So, but people are probably asking, oh, is this also, you know, do I look at how many friends I have on Facebook? There are studies that show that, you know, the number of friends that we have on Facebook is related to, um, you know, our social network size in real life. Um, so it may um, indeed be um, um, relevant in that scenario. But obviously we were sort of interested in that sort of the two core inner layers of our social network rather than, you know, every acquaintance you've ever met, which some people seem to add on Facebook. Well, I was going to say, how do you how do you judge the quality of the friendship and the strength of the friendship? Because there are many people who would just like to add people as friends who they've never met and probably couldn't name in their life. Yes, exactly. So, um, you know, in a way, we like to think that, you know, we, we have, like, uh, very large social networks. But, you know, if we think of the evolution of our species, you know, we're, we're really, you know, only able to cope with the cognitive, you know, processing power to keep track of all these relationships. So, you know, in real life, there's, there's only, like, a, you know, certain number. And so we were interested in these sort of, like, core um, social circles. Um, So we asked individuals, you know, who do you, you know, typically see sort of on a weekly and and monthly basis? So you've spoiled my fun there because I can't now go on to Facebook, claim a whole load of friends that I've never met before and suddenly have higher pain levels. Uh, Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's sort of very tricky also to tease apart sort of the causal relationships that are are involved here. So, yeah, I mean, there's a danger also of using social media too much because really we, you know, we're social animals and we rely on true social interactions much of the time. But, um, yes, I mean, perhaps, you know, by enhancing our social health and, you know, our feeling of, you know, connectedness to others, you know, we may be better primed to deal with pain.
So how can you use this information, this research that you've done? How, how will somebody put this into action? Well, there are, I mean, there are a lot more unanswered questions in the field. Some um, recent research suggests also that um, the, this endorphin system may be disrupted in psychological disorders such as depression. And this um, you know, may partly explain why these individuals often suffer from a lack of pleasure and social um, withdrawal. So that's sort of another interesting avenue for, for future research. Just some of the research that's gone into how having friends can give you a higher pain threshold. Katerina Johnson, doctoral student at the university's Department of Experimental Psychology in Oxford.